some time talking about the different types of examples of social media channels that are out there, highlighting some of the most popular ones. And of course, let's start with the biggest of the big, which is Facebook, right? The most widely adopted social media platform in existence right now. Um, and so, what you know, what can you do as a marketer to use Facebook to your advantage? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. The first of all is obviously you can create a page, a Facebook page. Right, that you can use to provide content, encourage your uh, consumers to like that content, and stay engaged with them on a regular basis that way. You can also create branded apps. So here's an example. These used to be more popular. Uh, I actually had some trouble finding a more recent one in this, but there's still some out there. Um, so this is actually a, a branded uh, slots game by uh, Caesars, right? The the casino. Uh, of course, they're in that space, so that makes a lot of sense. You should think carefully about creating a branded game uh, if you're not associated with something like the entertainment industry or something like that where it's a natural uh, match for you to do it. You might want to create a more utilitarian app as opposed to one of the Facebook branded game apps. But still, that, that's a possibility. Uh, one of the things that's nice about uh, the branded apps from a, from a marketer perspective Right, is that you get access to additional information about your consumers, whereas when someone just likes your page, you don't get as much access to individual content about them. Right? Uh, and in fact, if you want more additional information about uh, your users that's available through Facebook, you can use things like Facebook Connect, also known as a social sign-on platform. Right? And that allows users to say, log into your website using their Facebook credentials. Which means that first of all, they don't have to create a new credential set for your website, which as we'll talk about in the, when we get to developing websites is um, something that prevents people from using systems because they don't want to spend, go through the arduous task of developing yet another sign on, right? So by using this, it makes it easier for them to access. But the other nice thing is depending upon how you have the permissions set up with Facebook Connect, you can get access to additional information about that person automatically. Uh, things like maybe their birth date or their um, or, or their uh, list of their friends and things like that on the Facebook site. You can also use the like button on your own site, right? And this draws a connection between your site and Facebook, allowing people to promote content on your site directly on Facebook, thereby tying, allowing them to share that content that you've created. Kind of a form of an earned media, right? Because they're then creating a content piece on Facebook that represents the piece of con the, the website or whatever it is that they clicked on the like button. Now, it's not a very complex piece of content. It's essentially just saying this person liked this thing, right? But it is a, a piece of content that's out there, right? So Facebook has a number of different ways. You can, you can advertise. You can also encourage conversations about your brand, right? So you can do the earned media traditional framework. And you can also post your own content. LinkedIn, very similarly, has the ability, now this is usually more from kind of an HR perspective because you're looking on LinkedIn to hire people, but you can also use this as a thought leadership role. So you can create um, a, uh, a, a page on LinkedIn, like IBM has done here, right, to provide content about what IBM is doing. And that plays both an ability to uh, recruit, but also the ability to just kind of tell people about what IBM is up to. And you know, Google Plus is kind of the, another one in this space. It's maybe not as uh, popular as it once was, but it does have a certain uh, trendiness and usefulness among the, uh, specifically the high tech community. And Google Plus, a lot of conversations happen there uh, that are in that level. So here, for instance, I'm showing off uh, Nerdist, which is a, a content uh, group um, based around Chris Hardwick in some respects, right? that provides content on nerd-related activities, right? And so it's a classic example of the kind of stuff that Google Plus is still being used for in many ways. So those are three quick examples of broadcast social apps, right? Um, that are focused on social networking. Uh, Google you, Plus, you still, you know, you have to follow the, these individuals to kind of get their content. And you can get, you can broadcast content out to your neighborhood as well, your, your particular friends and so the other division of social networking apps that we talked about was messaging social networking apps. And the big difference here is that where the first one, kind of the focus is on sending content out to a wide group of your friends, here it's kind of more I'm directly communicating with a, a smaller group of friends in some cases. And the idea is here you have to say exactly who you want to communicate with rather than saying I'm going to broadcast to everyone, right? 
Um, and I have, and it might seem weird that marketers could be involved in this right off the bat, right? Because the fact that this is essentially, it's like getting involved in someone's text messages, right? Like how do I get involved as a marketer in these messaging communications? Well, there's a great example I like here on the WhatsApp platform uh, from Clark's, a, a, a shoe company, right? And they basically created this whole campaign called From Rats to Root Boys uh, around uh, the development of different shoes. And they kind of take you back in time uh, to 1962, right? Uh, where some of the first shoes that were kind of become popular within the Clark's framework uh, were developed, right? And you're essentially communicating with this guy, Steve Barrow, who is one of the people who originally developed some of these shoes. Right? And so you can text directly with them and you get via the WhatsApp app and kind of interact with them. And you'll notice they even have, you know, they put up the little thing saying, by the way, this is not actually Steve Barrow. This is a, a, a third party advertising company. Right. And so uh, just to make it perfectly clear, but, you know, it allows you to kind of have those kind of experiences. And that kind of builds some brand resonance, makes the brand feel more personal, has a lot of positive attributes to it. Right. Um, Another example, of course, is something like WeChat. And here you can see in WeChat, they actually have a sponsor. You can not only do the thing like you do with the Steve Barrow example in Clark's, but you can also do sponsored messaging that appears in your moments feed. And your moments feed is essentially important things that are happening within WeChat that they want you to know about, right? And so this gives them the ability to serve up content here. In this case, it's Coca-Cola. And one of the nice things about the WeChat and the WhatsApp apps is that they're actually also used in a lot of, especially WeChat and Line, which is very popular in, uh, WeChat's popular in China, Line is very popular in Japan. They're um, used uh, also as e-commerce platforms. So not only can you advertise there, but you can actually convince people to actually make purchases directly on those platforms. Right? And so this kind of gives you a way to move from social media as a pure advertising platform to actually a purchasing and sales platform as well. And so successfully launching campaigns to combine all those elements can really create for a dynamic digital marketing presence. Okay, so those are the, the network-based apps, the social network-based apps. I, and as I said, these lines are a little blurry, but the primary emphasis in both of these cases, the, both the broadcast and the messaging apps, is on communicating between peers, right? The other way we go is we can go to something like content creation. Here we're really talking about broadcast, where I put content up and anyone who wants to read it can read it. They don't have to have a previous connection with me, right? Uh, Twitter is a great example of this, right? So here um, I have a couple of examples of, of Twitter content from Eventbrite, right? So in the bottom corner here, we actually have their main feed, right? And Eventbrite is a event technology platform, allows you to buy tickets, things like that for different events going on, right? And you can see that they have their main feed where they put up content, their pin tweet, which is just the tweet that sticks to the top of their feed, is talking about the top six, net six networks for social media event marketing. So how to market your event once you've created it with Eventbrite, right? Um, but and additionally, they can also advertise uh, using promoted tweets. and if you've ever seen these, these essentially just show up in your Twitter feed as you're reading other tweets, right? And so the, the promoted tweets just show up in the middle of them. And so this is more of the paid advertising space. This is more of the owned content kind of space, right? And so you can use Twitter in both these the cases. And you can also do, similar to Facebook, you can do the social sign-in and tweet button, much like uh, you can in Facebook as well, providing you with additional access to your consumers in, in and of course, you can't mention microblogging without actually mentioning blogging, right? And so here we have, for instance, the White House blog, right? Where the, 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 the president is able to use the blogs, and Obama did this very well, to communicate with the citizens of the United States about what he's trying to do and about the benefits of his different packages and different plans and policies that he was pushing through, right? Um, now, blogging is a little old-fashioned. In some ways, it's one of the first, you know, modern social media platforms. If you, don't, if you skip over the BBSs and the forums and stuff like that, really blogging was one of the first step forwards in terms of social media, right? People would start posting these, these web pages essentially, which is what web logs, web blogs started as. And then people would comment on those web pages, right? Uh, and so you might think that like we've moved past that, right? That there's all these other things out there like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Like why do we still need to think about blogging? But blogging is still really useful in many respects. 
it can, first of all, boost search engine optimization. We're going to talk exactly about what that is later on. But the idea is, is that by putting up keywords associated with things that you think your consumers might like or want or need, right, you can draw people into it. So you can put a blog post, for instance, about, um, you know, take the event right example, about social media tools to advertise your events, right? And you can have a blog post about that. And then when people search for social media events, they could find that particular blog post, right? Um, and it allows you to capture more web search by having blog posts. Things like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, they're, they're, some of them it's impossible to actually search for on, through a traditional search engine. And some of them it's just it's a lot more difficult to do and they're not weighted as highly, whereas a blog post gets a lot more weight to it. Each blog post, right, can be and should be its own unique page providing unique content to your consumers about things that they might be interested in. And you can focus those blog posts around particular unique words, right? Which means you can have this content that is special and unique to that particular page, and you can have several of them with providing different avenues by which consumers can find out about your particular focal brand, right? One way to think of it is they provide a backbone for content sharing. I can go out, I can do my tweeting, I can do my YouTubing, I can do anything else I want to do in terms of social media, and I can have this single blog post that kind of sums up all those different activities, and I can point to it in all those, you know, so I can have a YouTube video where I say, if you'd like to learn more about this, read my blog post, right? It provides a backbone or support level for these other more ephemeral social media activities that we're doing. Um, and, and blogs can also be promoted in a number of different ways, so you can actually link to and push blogs in things like blog lists and stuff like that, and they can provide a way to participate in the social media community. So that, for instance, if you're reading something on um, Twitter and someone's commenting about something you wrote about, you can just write a, or write a statement saying, you know, hey, I wrote a blog post about this a while ago, you might want to check it. And that way you don't have to have like 20 million messages detailing all the reasons why you think what, how to answer their question, right? And, and really, that means you can become a source of thought leadership. Your company, if it has a good blog, can be seen as a place by which uh, people go to get the content, right? And so the, and that brand association with that thought leadership, with that educational aspect, will really promote your brand in many ways. I'm going to pause there, and we're going to come back and talk about Photoshare.